Hello, possums. I'm Rupert Murdoch. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, I'm Dr. Cindy Pan. Hi, I'm Ian Molly Meldrum. Hello, I'm Ian Thorpe. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Matt Damon. I'm Gough Whitlam. Hi, I'm Marsha Haynes. Hello, I'm Shane Warner. And I'm Kate Blanchett. Hello, I'm Caroline Jones, and I look forward to bringing you some great Australian stories. That was 1996. And who could have imagined that Australian story would still be going strong 20 years on? Over two decades, so many of you have allowed us into your lives and trusted us with your stories. In the process, you've held up a mirror to the nation, documenting the changing face and shifting moods of Australian society. Tonight, in the first of two special episodes, we celebrate this program's 20th anniversary. These are your stories. Yeah, come on! Here we go, this is it. Just a little bit nervous. The magic formula for a strange story. Nobody really knows it. Here he is, come on big boy. I suppose it's that sense of peeking over the fence and seeing someone else's life. I think that'd be I'm old. not worried mm. about no, it. No, you are. Okay, right. Are they tears of joy, are they? Huh? Showing a bit of that, that doubt and that fear and, and, and those struggles that we all go through and that make us human. Maybe we go backwards. Tough loss. What always fascinates me is how people overcome extraordinary hardships. I like the idea of people sharing their lives. <laughs> it does help that people know that they're not alone. had sort of given up documentary making or biography. A big country had ceased years beforehand. There was no record, documentary record, of, the, of Australian life, how ordinary Australians lived. And so I thought it was absolutely necessary that we start to document the life of ordinary Australians. Our first thoughts about the show were that we should look at conventional current affairs and do everything differently. Hello, I'm Mike Moore. Welcome to Frontline. This was the era of the ABC comedy program Frontline, which absolutely nailed a building suspicion and cynicism in the minds of the audience about the practices of journalists. Man, the man is an easy target, right? Now, the best way for a host to gain credibility is to line up an easy target and nail him. Relax, I'll, I'll go easy on you. The blood sport aspect of go for the kill current affairs. I'll ask you a few questions, Mr Lindani. It was the reporter against the, the person who didn't want to reveal this, that or the other. And we kind of got this idea, OK, we're all reporters. You know, we have this reporter background. Why don't we take ourselves out of this room? <laughs> Until then, have a great weekend. And tell stories through the eyes of people themselves. And that was the key uh, magical turning point in the evolution of the show. I've got an Australian story. To start with, I, I absolutely confess, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. So it evolved, and it evolved show by show. Out of there, Freddie. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this old box intent has been in the family for four generations. I have done a, a little bit of fighting inside of the ring and outside of the ring. And a bloke didn't really like the way I'd done things and that. So I had an argument with him, and uh, then he went and got a gun and shot me with a shotgun. And uh, that slowed me up a bit, yeah. Originally it had been a series of small magazine stories, which were great, light and happy often. My name's Quan. 
I play in a band called Regurgitator for a living. Uh, I live at home with my mama. She cooks for a living. We uh, do food and music and try and make them tasty. And thousands of tiny little beans cried out. <coughs> but we quite quickly evolved into a single topic per half hour. And that inevitably meant tackling stories in more depth. Rupert, when he wants to tease me, he says, you know, of course my mother beat me, you know. <laughs> I think there were two occasions that I applied the slipper and they were well merited and they had their effect and there was never any need for any more. <laughs> Families are a category um, which have provided a rich vein for Australian story. I'm terribly fortunate. My oldest son, John, and I have a very, very good relationship. It's in the dynamic of a family that characters are forged and destinies are set. You know, they say that if you give your children too much, they don't get the joy out of work. They just want the unearned things to keep falling from the sky. I'm Marley Ranaka. I was uh, Marley Henderson. I have no current relationship with my mother. It is totally non-existent. <sighs> Hello, mummy. <laughs> Ever since I can remember, if a kid wanted to tease me, it'd be about the colour of my skin, or it'd be about my mum and her accent, or about my lunch. During the lunch break, I would go and sit with Nazim. <laughs> I did that all through at primary school for the three <laughs> children. Because I was too frightened. I did not want them to get bashed. Yeah, I suppose having Charlie at 45 years of age, my personality changed like that. And then people come along and they you know, chop at this, chop at that, chop everything else. And uh, But I'm just Charlie's dad, you know, and uh, I don't feel very chopperish. <laughs> I'm just dadda. 54 years old, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to see my mother for the first time and she's going to see me. We didn't say a word. We just hugged. What I suggest is once we the relationship with my father didn't work out until only a couple of years ago. I rung my dad before I did go to New York and he said a beautiful thing to me. He said, um, he said, all the power to me. Guy rang me and he said, Mum, I've got something to tell you. He said, I'm on heroin, and he was sobbing. In the mid-1990s, there was a bad heroin epidemic in Australia, and we'd been looking at that as a possible topic. Heard about the story of a lady called Pat Ashton. And I'm the mother of a child who's regarded as a leper in this society. This is a story of Guy and his family, and his family's love for Guy. To be on Australian Story was a family decision. We needed the voice. We needed to tell the world how much we loved our child. We needed to tell the story of drug dependency and drug addiction. Before I knew it, I was in a cab on the way to Cabramatta. Once we arrived there, we had spent $2,000 on heroin. Here, she said, try this. I had never in all my years of dealing, never touched a needle. But this was my darkest hour and I succumbed like a kitten to milk. It was the battle of a mother trying to save her son's life. I watched him drown. He had his arms out, drowning from, his, from himself. And he just drowned and drowned, and I saw his head go under. And he drowned, and nobody listened, and they wouldn't help me. And nobody supported me, nobody! It's terrible when you see your own, your own flesh and blood slowly sink. And that's what heroin does. It's the bad stuff. This settee that he died on is a settee bed and he just looked like he was asleep on it. And I raced over to him and he was as stiff as a board. 
and black and blue. And then the ambulance arrived and that's the story of Guy's mighty fight with heroin. The experience of making Australian Story, whilst we were so raw, having just lost Guy a few months ago, was very cathartic. And for my family, I believe it was very, very healing. The impact nationally was huge. There was such a national outcry from parents who were in the same boat. We really opened up the debate. We really, really opened up the, the understanding. And I think the main thing that came out of it was that families no longer thought it only happened to other people. When we started Oz Story, a lot of other programs were just into gimmicks. And I think gimmicks like you know, fast editing. We wanted something much more classical. We wanted a cinematic look. those epic sort of landscapes, just trying to give it a, a longer pace. Let the camera run and see what happens. Sit back and just have gentle shots that move over the body in interesting areas. So we would let things happen, it wouldn't intervene much. I think it makes the viewer feel like that what's happening in front of them is unfolding in front of them. We were filming a story with uh, Brisbane Broncos coach Wayne Bennett and his son. And I was lucky they came perfectly the right way for me and it was just that nice natural chemistry between the father and son in a really joyous moment and yeah you just get lucky with that very occasionally. There's a fascination with the outback or rural stories it's not, a, to me, about the skyscrapers and, uh, and Bondi Beach. It is about what's happening out there. And I think the Australian story assists with opening up the souls of people quite vividly in front of you. When I first saw the landscapes and had a chance to travel around Kakadu and see the wetlands, I understood for the first time the term God's own country. If you know the place that you come from, that is really what defines you in terms of identity. Stories about the land, about what the land produces, it's a big part of being an Australian and there's a bit of that in, in all of us. much wildlife, lots of beautiful landscapes, big granite outcrops, the most amazing sunsets and sunrises you'll probably see anywhere. Once you get somebody starting to point out the problems, you start to look at it with fresh eyes. Oh yes. Nice home, Bruno. Really. You made it yourself. You made it yourself. Since the, the decision was made to make this place into a national park, my wife died, my father died, and my brothers died. And it's been a pretty tough going, really, over the last couple of years. Come on, get up! During 2000, it just stopped raining. I used to have a green lawn and I used to have a bit of a garden and that's all gone. Everything you look at is dying. Ah. 
Well, I first met Peter Andrews in 1972. He can do things with horses other people can't do. He has this belief that you can't create a great race horse without having the right environment. I heard about this crazy farmer called Peter Andrews who was doing really radical things to restore salt-ravaged, scoured landscape with enormous success. We were in the middle of a severe drought and the notion of somebody who might have some answers to something that has so bedeviled the driest continent on earth um, had obvious appeal. And I had a day with him and I couldn't understand a word he was saying. I went to see Jerry Harvey who had a property next door to Peter's and the first thing that Jerry said to me when I sat down was you and he said it emphatically you owe it to your country to do this story. We live off the land it's the most important thing. What is a more important story in the big picture? How much seed are you going to get off that? So when well, Peter Andrews first came here for four and a half years ago or something like that he's looked at this place and he said to me I can make this place a lot lot better and I've looked at it and said, well, it's not bad. And he said, yeah, it is, it's really bad. So originally what used to happen is the water would come down the creek. It created all this erosion and the water would come down and go zoop, and straight to sea and take a whole heap of, um, of soil and fertility with it and plant life. Now we're blocking all that, we're holding it and we're creating this uh, environment that allows us to retain all of this water and build all the plant life and the fertility. I saw that for land to go through a drought, you had to have reserves of water somewhere. And there were shapes in these sediments in the floodplains, which proved that they worked like a series of giant sponges that filled up and they trickle fed the rest of the system through the dry periods. One of the most iconic shots ever shown on Australian Story was showed on the neighbouring farms the land was brown and dry and parched, and on the other side of this line, there was this sparkling green oasis that was Peter Andrews' property. Well, the Australian story spread the message on Peter Andrews in a manner that was quite unbelievable. Everywhere I went, people said, oh, gee, I love that story. What happened that bloke? That's where it really struck a chord with people thinking this is really a worthwhile thing. I believe that. I think that should happen. Are you looking for trouble? No, I'm not looking for Are trouble. Are you looking I'm for trouble? No, not at all, Mr. Um, Ali. Well, don't give me no trouble. I'm not I had my first anxiety attack when I was 22 after smoking some hashish. And uh, it was pretty bloody powerful. And it came back very strongly when I started to put myself really out there with Norman. The marriage is OK, bud, isn't it? The marriage is OK. You know? Well, it's all right, but you're not helping, Norman. <laughs> it's funny, it's funny, it's funny. There's something warming and affirming when someone who uh, seems outwardly to be a tremendously powerful and successful person reveals frailty and struggle and difficulty in their own lives. I understand that you're soon to appear on the ABC television program Australian Story and I ask if you intend to reveal what we in Canberra these days call a dark secret. Um, well, um... Dad has not publicised the fact that Isabella has schizophrenia. Yeah, it's very sad and heartbreaking when this happens to a child. My career was just starting to take off at the time that I realised that I was gay. So I was just so scared that I was going to lose that. They have a lovely boutique there. I am what I would classify, and I know many people would, as an alcoholic. Um, most of the time I deal with it. Other times in my life it's been, it's reached crisis point and I do something about it. I gave Kerry the kidney for a number of reasons. But I'll be forever grateful. I mean, obviously, he, he, he saved my life. 
I couldn't live on dialysis. I, w I wouldn't. I'm as happy as a pig in shit! I was never happy. I mean, I was happy. I had moments of happiness, but I was never happy about my weight. No. Fat and jolly. I wouldn't have chosen to, to have Alzheimer's, but it's, I live, I, I like my life. Mum had been diagnosed <laughs> with know. Alzheimer's. When Alzheimer's Australia approached us and asked if Mum would do something and we came up with the idea of doing it with Australian Story. Hazel Hogg was the first high profile person to go public with her Alzheimer's struggle. Have you been on the Bridge Climb Hotel? Have you yeah, done well, it? Well, I reckon I must have because it seems very familiar and I think it was with the Heritage Council but a long time ago. We've got piles of this down the back of our place next to you, haven't we? Her hope for doing it settled to a sort of a mantra. If we can reduce stigma and raise money for research, then we should do it. You know, OK, I have an illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've acknowledged it. Yes. I manage it as best I can. Yes. I've been told in no uncertain terms, and I don't know on what authority, that it will progress. Mm -hmm. I just don't want my life to get more complicated. Okay. It's complicated enough. It's been a very public divorce. Yes. Hazel hasn't said that she's frightened, but so I, I pick up that feeling. Every single step of it, every bit of it's hard, but on a personal level, my hardest moment will be when she looks at me in the eyes, she doesn't know who I am. The reaction to the story really blew my mind. I had many reports of things along the lines of, well, if Hazel Hawke can do it, I can too. And it showed the audience that it doesn't discriminate. You can be the former wife of a Prime Minister and you can get Alzheimer's disease and there is nothing we can do to stop it. Must have been in there. <laughs> and it's okay. Yeah, well, that's my Australian story. Hello, I'm Andrew Denton, part of that strange and contemptible breed known as the celebrity. Oh, oh. <laughs> caught with a pants well met down. on the real <laughs> Do I look like a drag queen? <laughs> I wasn't a sissy. I was an ordinary little boy. I've been waxing lyrical about right. it. I'm really well. I'm not just that girl on Home and Away. She's a sweet girl. Tonight's definitely an A-list. I see a name like a person like Robin Hughes in this room. It confirms to me this is an A-list gathering. There are some members of the media who don't understand that you're real people. It's very easy to, to be put on some kind of pedestal. The larrikin. The larrikin. I wasn't a larrikin. I was a quiet, nice boy. The criticism that has always been levelled at us and to which we're vulnerable is that we're, that we're soft, that we give people an, an easy ride. Where are we eating? I'm not trying to divide this nation. I'm trying to unite us and say we're all Australians. Sometimes I think it can be a bit soft. Most programs benefit from a devil's advocate and sometimes Australian story is lacking that. You were going to empty that one, too. <laughs> I would love occasionally to have an interviewer there who could say, um, but you're a bit of a shit, aren't you? I mean, you're not as flash as you make out. You haven't got the ability to do an aggressive interview with a newsmaker. You can't do that on Australian Story, that's not its role. I think that sometimes with a softer approach you relax the person so much more and they sometimes tell you things they would not tell a more, um, a more aggressive kind of interviewer. And I'm thinking of Peter Hollingworth, for example, when he was Governor-General. 
It's the first time in this one. First time I've done it as Governor General. When Dr. Peter Hollingworth was appointed to the highest office in the land, no one could have predicted the controversy that would soon engulf the man. Former Anglican Archbishop of Brisbane, Dr. Peter Hollingworth, has been sworn in as Australia's 23rd Governor General. The case involves the abuse of girls at an Anglican school in the southern Queensland town of Toowoomba. Dr. Peter Hollingworth was the Anglican Archbishop of Brisbane at the time, and it's alleged he failed to act in his position of authority. The Governor-General was under a great deal of pressure from the media and elsewhere about alleged mishandling of sex abuse cases when he was the Anglican Archbishop in Brisbane. So like every other media outfit, we put in a bid. At the time, it was a great scoop because he hadn't here, gone public, he hadn't spoken at all um, about any of these matters. The Governor-General is at the centre of a new sex abuse controversy, but friends of Dr Hollingworth believe he's the victim of a vendetta. We put questions to Dr Hollingworth about a number of these um, sex abuse cases, and one of them was about a woman who claimed that in the 1950s, when she was a minor, she had been abused by a priest who had subsequently risen to become a bishop. The great tragedy about this situation is that the genesis of it was 40 years ago, and it occurred between a young priest and a teenage girl who was under the age of consent. My belief is that this was not sex abuse, um, there was no suggestion of rape or anything like that. Um, quite the contrary. Uh, I'm sitting there watching Australian Story with interest and when I heard the line um, that suggested that the young woman at the centre of a sexual abuse case had in fact not been a victim but rather almost a predator, I felt very distressed. I knew that young woman and we'd been at an Anglican hostel together. The Governor-General's last ditch attempt to put his house in order as the... And I thought, I have to speak out. The Governor-General's own remarks on Australian Story on Monday night, part of that rebuttal, have arguably made his situation worse. It's just a continuation of the line she asked for it. Here's a little baby Lolita, you know, trapping this man. Dr Hollingworth will stand aside from his position as Governor-General. What Peter Hollingworth's story did was it certainly meant that nobody assumed that an appearance on Australian Story would be a free kick. And it became obvious to others uh, what had always been obvious to us, that there was um, the potential for revelations that weren't entirely flattering. And the Logie goes to Australian Story. So there is always a price for, for success, we know that. It was always accompanied by a sense of heightened risk, if you like. You know, the higher you go, the, high, uh, the further you fall. Monday night, don't miss an extraordinary Australian story. Well, I wrote a sketch for CNNN back in 2003 that I guess poked fun at the the tendency for Australian story to be rather maudlin and tragic. It was about this time I lost my husband and found out that both the children had cerebral palsy. And it was almost like you, you weren't even allowed to be a subject on Australian Story unless you had two types of advanced cancer and had lost a limb. Just after my second husband died, I was diagnosed with cancer. It was meant to fool viewers that they were actually watching a real promo. And we did fool many people. A lot of people watched this thinking, oh, that looks like an interesting story. Oh, we better tune in for that one next week. And I also lost the farm. Beautifully told, award-winning misery. When you're the stuff of parody, it shows that you've gone really mainstream. Ordinary Australians, extraordinary bad luck. That's Australian Story. He was swearing at him, he was going, fuck mate, just put the gun down. Poise mate, don't do it mate, don't do it. Everything about it. Off. And that's when Joey entered the bang. Never seen or heard a boyfriend since. I think the public are interested in true uh, crime stories because the narrative is often uh, simple. Uh, it's around the truth. 
you know what the end of the plot is, but uh, humans have this thing, they want the sordid details, they want the dirt. When they said it was Ivan Light, that was it. I knew then that Ivan would never see the light of day. I basically feel in my own heart, Ivan has betrayed the whole family and thrown their whole names and every bit of reputation they got. He didn't care if he dragged it through the mud. I think if you go back to the books of Sherlock Holmes, everyone wants to know why. It's a, it's a mystery, it's the intrigue, it's a curiosity. They've got you, mum, got you. The investigation has been an uphill battle because it's very, very hard to believe that a mother can kill her children. One night I went to take a drink and I was king hit. I was kicked in the head a number of times. I got onto my hands and knees and stood up. I wanted to show that a whistleblower had what it took. I remember pulling out my pistol and you know and just seeing her change, you know, her face and, and everything just turned into this distraught mess. And that's when it clicked to me, yeah, and I and I realised, well, you know, this girl's about the same age as my sister, you know. Scott was arrested about ten o'clock on the evening of the seventeenth of April. We arrived in Bali within three days. We gave him a cuddle and I shed a few tears. It's dreadful. It's extremely important to have my parents here. My parents are giving me satisfaction of that I'm not, you know, that I'm not a complete uh, failure to them. I didn't feel I had any choice at all. I felt I just had to kill him. I just thought I've got to kill him or he's going to kill one of my kids and I couldn't live with that. And I was standing right in front of him, the gun pointed right at him, and the trigger just wouldn't go. I just couldn't pull it. I never actually shot at Kevin. I went there with the intention of killing Kevin Smith. Thanks me, Kevin. Don't be shy. My mother didn't want to kill my father because she was driven by revenge. She acted because the police didn't act. I've been shot at. I've been bashed. I first heard about Catherine Smith in 2008. It's been a long time since Catherine Smith smiled like this. She'd just been acquitted of the attempted murder of her husband and during her trial, she had given evidence of years of violent abuse at her husband's hands and a complete lack of police action against him. Kevin dragged me out of that door. He had me by the hair. In 2008, domestic violence was an issue that remained stuck in the shadows. And that's the context, I think, in which Catherine's story started to break through. The judge at my trial was the only one I've ever seen in my entire married life keep Kevin Smith in line. And I just, can I say, loved him for that. It was the first time I ever felt that I got justice was from when I was on trial. The impact of having everyone know our story put a lot of pressure on the authorities to act. To gather what evidence we can. Um, Kevin was charged with 25 offences. There was several charges of attempted murder. There were several charges that related to sexual assault offences. All significant matters. I really believe that without Australian story, we'd still be in hiding. Our lives would still be in a lot of danger. This is the first day of Kevin's trial. I've been looking forward a long time to giving my evidence and having Kevin brought to justice. This trial is going to be the biggest battle that our family has gone through. If my father is convicted, it does mean um, a new life for the whole family. It means freedom.
to actually go through a trial is such a courageous thing to do, to sit in the same courtroom close to the perpetrator. So I, I felt it was my role to help to support um, Catherine through that trial, just to remind her every day that what she was doing was standing up for women in our nation. The jury went out a couple of hours ago, we were waiting for the verdict, and I feel really quite ill. And I've just got a message from Elizabeth Broderick, which has made me calm a little bit. Whatever happens, you and your children have so much to be proud of. On behalf of women all across Australia, thank you for never giving up. <laughs> um. And then after that, it was just guilty, 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 guilty. <laughs> the power of Catherine's story is that it created change in the very institutions that needed to change. Well done. It's being used by the New South Wales Police Force to help train officers in how to better handle uh, domestic violence cases. We polled 100 people to find the most despised thing in society. Right down here, off the scale, at 117%, we have politicians. I'm Natasha Stott Despoyer, and I'm off to the office. I don't apologise for using different channels of the media to spread the message that, you know, politics is important. Politics does affect your life. It is vile, it is disgusting that people would even try and you know, compare me to Hitler. And I question them, what have I ever said or ever done that could ever relate me to anything what Hitler has done or ever said? They might throw me out of Parliament. That would be good, wouldn't it? I'd spend more time up here at the resort, but I'd still get media coverage for whatever I said. So of course, I'm going in the yellow um, for Palmer United. But, uh, it's my main speech today. In the end, it's a hell of a democracy that can find room for Jackie Lambie. Oh, this is pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> no, Dad, that's not... Dad, I, that's too much. I think the political profile, its role is to paint a picture so that you can actually understand some of the background of where the leader that you're being asked to vote for comes from. Okay, if you want, if you want to wear the coat, that's fine. Our families have undergone you know, a lot of stress and strain from the sort of life that we've lived. Uh, our approach to that stress and that strain has been to, uh, to bind together. And it was very much, in the end, I suppose, John and I against all odds. Oh, that, that's, um, that's you. It's one of the that's real oh, reasons I've got yeah, involved in politics at all, yeah. is the sense of um, un unfairness and lost opportunity. That's a proud dad. It does make me, you know, burn with anger that someone like my father didn't get the opportunities he should have had. I had a very impoverished background. Poverty was real to me. It existed. It was my daily life. I think the most difficult thing about doing stories about politicians, especially high-profile politicians, is they are utterly concerned about the image. Minders get in the way, they start controlling what you can film and what you can't film. In Christian time, advisers come along and try to manipulate or change the um, politicians they work for. Uh, my view is it doesn't work. Fiji Cooley, the blast downer. Go ahead, sucker, make my day. What's the allegation? Who were they? When did it happen? They can give you advice on what interviews to do and what interviews not to do. For example, they advised me not to do a Australian story. The challenge is to accept that, yes, that person has a lot of image to protect, uh, but you've got to try to get through to uh, the person who perhaps um, is a friend of somebody, who's someone outside their political job. Plates in oven. Dad, you can do plates in oven. Right, OK. When I covered Malcolm Turnbull in 2009, he was opposition leader. I thought that his story was always going to be fascinating. My father bought this 
place in 1981, and then he was killed in an aeroplane accident uh, basically a year after he bought it. I buried him here. Anything I could do to attach myself to a memory of him, I did everything. I couldn't bear the thought of losing him was so hard to deal with. So I kept everything of his. And it took me many years to get used to the fact that he was gone. Malcolm played ball. Malcolm revealed a lot about himself. He was emotional. Um, if he hadn't been, it could have been, oh, he's, you know, political free kick. OK. It became apparent that he was determined determined to go after Kevin Rudd, who was then Prime Minister. Mr Gretsch, have you cited email, note, memorandum emanating from the Prime Minister's office to Treasury? What Godwin Gretsch suggests in his evidence is that there's an email from the Prime Minister's office proving Treasury was asked to give special treatment to a mate, a man who gave Kevin Rudd a ute he still uses as an electorate office on wheels. But the email that is at the centre of all this that would link the Prime Minister to any of this can't be found. If the Prime Minister and the Treasurer cannot immediately justify their actions to the Australian people, they have no choice but to resign. Chris Shulman says it appears the email in question has been found in Treasury system by police and that is fraudulent. It appears to have been concocted inside the Treasury Department. When I was in Malcolm Turnbull's parliamentary offices and all hell broke loose as the Godwin Gretsch email was found to be a fake. That's all they're saying. They've run it on the start of World Today as well. So. They were familiar with me being around. I've been around for a long time and they, I think, forgot about me. Well, it's a breaking story, Belinda. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to think. I'm here to find out what's happening. <laughs> what is happening? Well, there's... Um, it's, just, it's been concocted it's just, inside yeah. the Treasury Department. And I was able to just move around. Pearls, frumpy, little old lady that I was <laughs> and still am. I can't just say I'm sending an email. At the time, Malcolm Turnbull was in the house, but near the end of the day, uh, he came back in, saw me there and went, what are you doing here? And I quickly took my leave and went home to Melbourne. Come on, you don't get to be world champion by sitting on your butt. <laughs> Did I feel guilty? Did I feel like I dethroned someone that the whole country wanted to win? And was I the person who shot Bambi? Did that ever worry me for a second? Not at all, not a nanosecond. Many a sports story is alluring because the competitor, the individual has undergone a painful process to get there or something extraordinary. I remember when the doctor came in, he said that I had broken my neck. It just felt like my world just kind of crashed. She just grabbed me by, by the arm and uh, pulled me by the, by the bedside. I moved the only thing that I could, which was my left hand. <clears throat> and I said to Marv, I'll still be right for Beijing. When I'm standing behind the ball ready to kick it, it's, it's sort of similar to when I'm praying because I have to be in total concentration. It's a pretty much a connection between me and God. I'll make sure I say a few prayers beforehand. I believe in myself and I just want to back myself and make sure I follow through and kick that ball. And as I move in, I think about it again. So it's pretty much just asking God to hopefully make it easier for me. Back. You want everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm a guy now in, in my stage of my life. I, I just don't want any dramas. Good drama, bad drama. I just don't want it anymore. So are you interested? He was never embraced in a way that some great golfers are. Ricky Ponting retires on top and on his own terms. They were words that I never thought I'd hear. We just thought Rick was going to play, play, play. 
I thought, he's not dead yet, people, it's just cricket. Tonight's program centres on one of the most devastating moments in Australian Olympic history. Australian women's rowing is in disarray tonight over the collapse of an athlete in the women's eight during yesterday's final. Suddenly fatigue sets in and I just can't move, you know. It, it was so bizarre. No one had really experienced this type of failure before. There was nothing wrong with the boat. There was nothing wrong with the seven other athletes around me. And um, so we had nine in the boat. There was eight operating. And from that one remark, it just opened up the biggest can of worms. <laughs> so when it happened, it was the age-old journalist question, why? Build it up now, girls, build it up! The starting gun went and it was possibly one of the best starts we'd ever done. Let's take Romania! Katie's call was, let's go, we're going for it, let's take Romania. And that it, and it was when the next stroke, just the blade, there was a blade out of time. I think my heart went into my throat. <laughs> and then I came forward and I couldn't row anymore because Sally had let go of her blade. I'm supposed to be rowing and I'm not rowing and I'm sitting here. And I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. She should never have been put in the boat in the first place. Headwinds will really use the resistance to drive the boat through the second half. It was stunning to find out that there had been so many times where this had surfaced and yet nothing had been done about it. There were nine documented examples in all of Sally Robbins not completing the course to the full extent. I think everybody in Australian rowing knew about it. Whether they say they did or they didn't, I think everybody knew. They wanted to be heard. They didn't want to go down as the bitches from hell who came out and stabbed their fallen teammate in the aftermath of the battle. They wanted to be seen as having a valid story of criticism, of evaluation. We'd been portrayed in some respects terribly <laughs> and I think we just wanted to clear the air. And I guess getting our story out to a, a wider audience, I guess offered a real sense of closure too. This is Australian Story. Hi, this is Australian Story. I would love to do the introduction to one. That's what I'd like to do. I'd like to get dressed up as Caroline Jones. Hello. Tonight a very special Australian Story. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. I certainly had my share of them and I had an addictive personality, which was better than having no personality. I would be playing Charles, a younger, uh, much more dashing and, and, and handsome version of Charles. Um, and he's very lucky to have me in that position and he knows it. All I could think was, I survived suicide bombing in Pakistan, I was held at gunpoint once and I survived that, and I'm going to die by kangaroo, like do you, my parents would be so embarrassed. I've always wanted a Tiffany pen with wanker inscribed on it. <laughs> All you do is shrivel at this age, girls. <laughs> we raised the headlines because we thought, oh, well, let's go for it. <laughs> at our ages, mind you, but, you know, you've got to get in there and have fun. <laughs> a story likely to provoke strong feelings and intense discussion. At its heart, the issue of family. It's an area where science and social change are combining to present new challenges. Hey. Yeah, hi, Joyce, how are you? My brother called and uh, he said, we want to do something, Trace. I was going to adopt the child to her. She was overwhelmed, she was crying and screaming. She didn't know what to think. I feel guilty about my joy because the my joy it came such a price for them. 
I did make a terrible mistake for myself because of the grieving I've gone through, but I made a good um, choice for Tracy and Rick. But I would never do it again. Never. Uh, there was a shortage of sperm donors. So I thought, well, it doesn't look like I'm going to have a family, but I may be able to help other people because I knew what the pain was like not to have children when you wanted them. It's a bit bizarre, wasn't it? It's funny looking back on it now. This is weird. She's our biological child and we're just meeting high. <laughs> you know, very strange. In 2005, when she was 21, I told her that she was donor conceived. I was very nervous. All that I knew about my biological father was he had blonde hair and blue eyes, he was 5'11", and he was known by this pseudonym of C11. After I read the letter, I went and showed it to my mum, and she, she sort of gave a little yelp, and she's like, oh my gosh, his father was Manning Clark. I've never had a negative reaction from a gay man to my being a father. Is it the sexuality that matters or is it the quality of the relationship with that child? Yeah? There are some pretty awful heterosexual fathers and we know that. Get the focus and exposure worked out. I understand that my story may seem confusing to some people. I see it as quite a simple thing. My body was blessed with the ability to provide life. Shoulders around, good. I had the capacity to bear a child, and I'm a man. It is amazing how rapidly the ground has shifted. The pace of social change and um, acceptance of change and diversity um, is accelerating all the time. The lyrics to that song were just so funny. Ancient Egypt, down by the mouth. Mummy's gonna be. I can remember the first time I saw her eyes, and I, I don't know, I just have a, a really vivid memory of that moment, and she looked so sad. It's the first time a high profile Australian has been openly in a gay marriage, and already there have been attacks on Karen Phelps and Jackie Stricker. I just felt intuitively that having a Jewish wedding ceremony was something that would be important to Jackie. The ceremony was everything that we had hoped it might be. It was very romantic, it was very private. It was a traditional wedding and we substituted husband and wife with life partner. Congratulations, I wanted to do whatever it was that made an ultimate commitment, and marriage was the ultimate commitment. Really, and they sang that fantastic song yeah. about <laughs> when and we did our story. Together. The aim was to make everybody out there realise that you could have a happy, normal life being in a same-sex relationship. Oh, that looks really nice. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah, I think everyone was a bit nervous because it's very new territory. Showing affection in public with Jackie is something that I've had to really come to grips with and overcome a lifetime of conditioning. I, I really said to myself, now, Karen, hang on a second, why shouldn't you hold the hand of the person that you love? And then the heat warms after you blanket. That's exactly right. So you write that down. After the airing of the Australian story, I went along to school as normal. Well, I received a note in the staff room saying, um, would you please stop? talking about this and I chose to ignore it and I chose to leave teaching. There were a number of particularly conservative columnists who made very hurtful comments about our relationship, about how dare we talk about marriage. If I look back then, we were reluctant to walk along the beach holding hands. You were. I wasn't. <laughs> Well, there was the kiss on the cheek, which was called tacky. True. And, I mean, when you think of that now... Yes, we've come a really Night. long way. Night. Oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> My life has been adversity. But from each disaster, I've come back stronger. One of the pluses of Australian stories is it's not all doom and gloom. 
The recovery has really been amazing and much greater than I thought and much quicker than I thought. And the idea isn't just to make Woolene a nice little oasis for us. It's not just about Woolene, it's about the, the whole picture. I don't think I could just stand back and continue to do what has been done in the past. Even if it doesn't work, at least I'll know that um, I, I gave it a go. Real life isn't all negative and dreadful things. In amidst the awfulness, there's a lot of good stuff quietly happening. The most important thing that you will learn from me is that you can be Aboriginal and you can be successful. Hands up if you're an Aborigine in the room here. Hands down. Hands up if you love being black. You better be. I like school because it's given me uh, education. What I've learned was that you just don't sail through. You just don't drift along. You've got to keep the mind under check. I think I manage, manage my anxiety. Most actors, they're always trying to work out why people are doing what they're doing, you know. I'm trying to work out why I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm getting there. <clears throat>